Welcome to Drinks in the Library, the only library where drinks aren't just allowed, they are required. I'm your librarian host, Gigi Howard, and each episode I'll be interviewing a guest about a much-loved book that we will be pairing with a drink for you to enjoy along with us or consider for your next book club meetup. As always, stay curious and support your local library. Hello, Libration Nation. I'm so thrilled to be coming to you this week uh, with Dr. Nan Carmack as we talk about the book Ahab's Wife or the Stargazer by Sina Jeter Nasland. Nan is the Director of Library Development and Networking at the Library of Virginia. She works with all the public libraries in the Commonwealth. She's also an adjunct professor at ODU's Master in Library and Information Science. After her first career as a mental health therapist and then also a short stint as an independent bookstore owner, Nan finds that public libraries are the perfect intersection of social justice and intellectual curiosity. She's also an amateur artist and enjoys getting her hands dirty in the garden. (laughs) She wrote this. She's become one of those embarrassing people whose dogs are her children now that her family has flown the coop and she and her husband live here in Richmond and naps are a priority in her life. Um, In addition to all this, Nan is also currently serving as the president of the Virginia Library Association. Uh, where she has been an active member. Um, And I've also worked with her within that association for a long time now. And Nana is definitely a person that I look up to, you know, respect and um, is such a supporter of libraries and librarians, not only here in Virginia, but around the United States. Um, So I was just thrilled that she agreed to come on. And we had a Wonderful conversation. Um, The cocktail we chose was the Nantucket. And no, I didn't just choose it because her name is Nan. Nantucket is a place where our story is heavily set. So it kind of all worked out. I hope you enjoy this and thanks so much. Sure. Yeah. I'm super excited that you started this podcast. I'm I'm up to the death episode. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> have you listened the whole way through yeah and i i you know I wished i had that book yeah because i lost my dad during Aww. covid um not of covid but it, it was a bitch man yeah because i moved home and took care of him because we weren't gonna put him anywhere right and oh, I didn't know we that. couldn't get anybody to come in yeah so. during that time what year yeah. was that 21 okay the like october of 20 to january of 21 okay. september i guess okay well, I have a copy. You can have my copy if you want the, from the from here to I've eternity. Already, I have already ordered it. <gasps> yes. Because my mom is still living. She's 95 years old. Okay. And we're going to be doing this again, I'm assuming, uh, yeah. <laughs> at some point. Yeah. So. I, I think we all are. And so. that's going to be, that's gonna that loss is going to hit me harder. Dad was so sick. He had congestive heart failure and dementia, and it was suffering. Mm-hmm. But mom's fam tends to live to a ripe old age and then stroke out. Okay. And so I'm going to be like, because it'll be sudden. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's always I haven't I haven't lost either of my parents. Um, but I've lost other people and it's always like is it better to lose them fast or slow? Either. For them fast. fast. For us not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well I'm glad you're up to that episode. That was fun. Yeah. So cool. All right. So we're here today and first off I Let's talk about what book did you choose? Yes, I chose Ahab's Wife, mm-hmm. also called The Stargazer, yes. by Senna Jeter Nasland, mm-hmm. who I got to meet one time. Um, and I thought I would have all of these compelling and insightful things to say to her. And it came my, t- my turn in line. And, and all I could summon was, I loved your book. <laughs> So I also have a bit of shame attached to this book because mm. I couldn't come up with anything mm. intelligent to say. Mm. So I feel like this is almost a redo for me. So we'll hope Miss Naslin hears this someday. Hopefully. I mean, we can <laughs> I can definitely see what social she's on and tag her. So this is Ahab's wife. And so with that, I did read it. This is a very long book. It is a very long book. I read the abridged 
version, okay. which is still pretty long. Yep. And it's probably a normal length. <laughs> How many pages? You've got, like, it's, the real copy. I do. Um, this was the first edition. Of course, our, at that time, Pet Rabbit has had its way with the dust cover in, okay. the, in the spine. <laughs> um, it's, like, 640-odd pages. So mm-hmm. it's a commitment. Mm-hmm. But honestly, you will get so sucked in. Yeah. Yeah, so I read it, and then for the drink, there's quite a few scenes set in Nantucket. Yes. So I and also your name is Nan. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if that's like a little too on the nose, but I was like, it's perfect. even more perfect. It's perfect. Yes. yes. So and this we're is drink- delicious. It's very good. It's so it's white rum, mm-hmm. cranberry juice. Those are equal parts, and then. Um, what is it? Grapefruit juice. Ooh. Like kind of a splash. I can feel that little. Yeah. I think it would be good with like a little lime, but yeah. I just I didn't have it. Okay. So anyway, I hope you enjoy your Nantucket. Thank you. It's delish. <laughs> I was thinking like, what does one drink mm-hmm. for this book? And I was thinking like a rum punch. And then here yeah. you arrive with the absolute perfect drink. So, Well, I'm glad I was able to just like pull it all together. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So, all right. So always I first, who were you when you read this book? I was in a weird place in my life. I was not even a librarian yet. Okay. I was the mother of two young boys, and um, I would (laughs) take them. I lived in the Bedford County area at the time, and I would take them up to the Peaks of Otter and let them play in the creek so I could read. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And it was a bit of an escape. Um, I was, I had been working in in a helping profession before. And thought, well, I should stay home with my kids. I have that luxury. At that time, I was married to a doctor, a family doctor. And um, I was a terrible stay-at-home mother. I mean, it's amazing someone did not die. Um, I just, I was unfulfilled. I was bored. Mommy needed a job. Mm -hmm. And so in reading this book, A, it was, you know, hey, 600-odd pages, so it was a really good escape. Mm -hmm. But it's really a tale about a woman finding herself. Yeah. And navigating her sources of her life. And <clears throat> the first line in this book is, Captain Ahab was neither my first husband nor my last. Mm-hmm. And I think that f- that line, that opening line, is as compelling as Call Me Ishmael in yes. Moby Dick. Yes. Because Ahab, you know, of course. is, sort of, And it was really um, an interesting way to start a book about a woman's journey and how she kind of navigated all of the things that were thrust upon her. Mm-hmm. And that was that really spoke to me during this time um, where I was considering what's my next move and mm-hmm. well, I think this marriage might be failing. And here was this woman who, here she was, who had so many more challenges than I did mm-hmm. and found her way. And it was, um, so I didn't, in hindsight, I think all of these things, in the moment, I don't think, I knew that's why it was so, I I mean, I've read this book multiple times. Yeah. Which sounds insane for a 600-odd page book. It's impressive. So, but I also had a lot of time on my hands (laughs) in between Rewind and Barney the Dinosaur. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, so I think that this was having an impact on me that I didn't even know at the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, hindsight is 2020. Right, yeah. And so, and you touched on it, too. Mm -hmm. So she's Ahab's wife. So for those of us, and look, I got a copy of Moby Dick because I was like, (laughs) maybe I can peruse this. And so Ahab is from Moby Dick. Yes, he is the captain of the ship. Yes. Um, In Moby Dick. Yeah, and I'm just curious, have you read this I have read that book. You've read Moby Dick. I have. Um, I just felt like I, you know, couldn't fully appreciate this book if I didn't read that book. So I did read it after I read this book. How did you feel about it? I'm not I kidding. hated it. Oh. <laughs> it was a painful book to read. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah. So, and, it, and, you know, Ahab is only a very small part of mm-hmm. Ahab's wife. Mm-hmm. It's really about her. Right. And Una. Una is her name. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ahab only pictures briefly um, and his madness and um, the things that happened to him and their impact on her and their family. Um, so, yeah, I did read Moby Dick. Yeah. Well, combine, I mean, that's like 7,000 pages. So, 
I'm very <laughs> impressed. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I really enjoyed it too. I mean, just her journey, and like you just said, she he's only mentioned very briefly in mm-hmm. Ahab's Wife, mm-hmm. where she only got like what a paragraph in yeah. Moby Dick. Right. I think that this was almost writing that wrong um, in some ways. Good for Cena. Yes. For, you know, coming out with the feminist side yes. of Moby Dick. Yes. I can turn anything into a feminist manifesto. Okay. Right? <laughs> Moby Dick. <laughs> Hemingway, we're right. coming for we're you. We're coming for you next, man. <laughs> All right. So what pulled you in about the story? I mean, you kind of already yeah. touched on that yeah. a little bit. I do love a good long book. Yeah. Um, I love... A book that has so much setting that it's immersive. Like you can just, Naslin's writing is so incredible that it just pulls you into the scene and you sort of forget where you are um, and you're living and walking in in Una's feet and traveling uh, along her path in such an immersive way. And and I think at that time in my life, I was needing... um, some immersion in something like I needed something to just commit to. Um, <clears throat> and reading this book was really about that. There's also themes about in this book about literature and um, was leading me down the path to librarianship, of course. And she, she values Una, the main character values books and literature and reading. At one point she even meets Nathaniel Hawthorne. Right. So, you know, so this, this book is also populated with people and characters that I love. And so it was like meeting an old friend mm-hmm. um, in the pages of this book. And she has other elements in there as well. She, there's pictures for sure. I think what I'm thinking about is like the extracts I read at the first part. Just quotes from Moby Dick, from yes. Uncle, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yes. Yeah. There's um, the enslaved woman who features in this book named Susan. Was a, a primary character and a primary um friend and supporter of Una and also shows up in Naslin's work, The Four Spirits, about the the young girls who were killed in the church bombing. Mm-hmm. And Susan appears in that book. And again, it's almost like this little Easter egg of, oh my God, there's that's Susan, like our Susan. Yeah. Like, that's how I feel about her. And so, yeah. um, it, yes, she addresses a lot of things from uh, the plight of women during that time and the wailing world and religious fervor and enslavement and, and, and and it just keeps going on. And and that's why it's so long because she touches on so many important themes. Yeah. (laughs) Or did any of those really stand out? I mean, she, like you said, I mean, there was a lot of religious themes that came out, Mm -hmm. feminism. Mm -hmm. Were there any of those stories that really spoke to you at the time? Um, you know, in the opening chapters, she is fighting with her father and is shipped off to live on an island yeah. with her aunt and uncle, um, pushed there by her father's religious fervor, which she didn't really buy into. And there, but there were just so many characters that demonstrated this, the breadth and depth of different kinds of religious belief mm-hmm. and spiritual belief and believing in something larger, or did you uh, subscribe to the organized religion of the era? And and it was just um, it, that kind of evoking that everybody is different. And yet children particularly and women particularly uh, were expected to live up to what the men in their life believed. They didn't get room for their own beliefs. And that she was so happy on this island with three other people and a dog. Like, I'm like, that's me. I could be happy on an island with one person and a dog. Like, <laughs> and then she yeah. runs off to sea and is yeah. a boy for a while. And right. she's, yeah. she's the, she's the um, I don't know what you call them, but she's like just the captain's Cap- boy. The captain's boy, yeah. And just did whatever she was, he, presenting as mm-hmm. a he, um, on the ship just to get out of there. Yeah. And I thought that was very sp- I don't know if brave or foolish or <laughs> okay. <laughs> she you do it. that, girl. Yeah. yeah, she did. And then she had to get, I remember, she was so happy on the island. And there was yeah. that was the lighthouse. Yes. And that's when she first started having her relationship, her sort of spirituality. Yeah. 
yeah. and looking at the sky. But she had wanted her father, she was sent away because her mom was worried that her dad was going to kill her. Yeah. Because of her lack of Belief. religious fervor. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it just, again, is that, that God, what do you, you know, how grateful we are to be women in a contemporary society, mm-hmm. yet we still have our battles yeah. to fight. Yeah. I mean, but she seemed to bear it pretty well. She She survived. She, you know, the common phrase of she persisted. Mm -hmm. And she did. And she was led very much by her own ideals. You know, I'm going to do what works for me right now. Right. And that was not uh, a common trait, I don't believe, during those times. I know. I don't think so at all. I think it was, yeah, because going back to, like, the Herman Melville stuff. Yeah. I mean, I I was reading a thing where he said he didn't think women should read Moby Dick at all. It was just right. not appropriate. Right. Because we're yeah. supposed to read romances and swoon on our painting couch. <laughs> and at that time, maybe not even know how to read. You right. Know? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts of, like, the juxtaposition of Una to Ahab? Um I honestly, even though they did not stay together and they had their um, issues, I feel like they were cut from the same cloth. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's why it didn't work for them, because he was going to do what he was going to do. But so was she. Right. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, it's it's that that uh, disaster of being exactly like your partner. They maybe should have thought that went through a little bit harder. Yeah. You know, and she had multiple husbands. Yeah. Throughout the book, and she seemed happiest with Kit, who was a also a sailor, and she mm-hmm. met on the ship where she was um, pretending to be a boy, mm-hmm. and um, that scene where he realizes she's a woman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's it, she's a fascinating um, character out of time and space. Yeah. And yet, women came to her for advice and counsel, and. Um, sketchy alternatives to things if you will Mm -hmm. right (laughs) (laughs) and so she just really I mean she just lived she just lived her own authentic life Mm -hmm. and played the hand that was dealt her Mm -hmm. to the best of her ability but also to the best for her happiness Mm -hmm. and I think that pursuit of her own happiness was rare right just as much now as then I think yeah and so going back to who you were at that time and thinking about it, I mean, what other books were you reading at that time? Do you remember? I was reading a lot of early Barbara Kingsolver. Okay. She was not yet Barbara Kingsolver when I was reading these books. She mm-hmm. wasn't, she, you know, was reading her early work like Bean Trees and Animal Dreams. And, and all of them have um, the sort of same kind of yearning for release Mm -hmm. for following your own path and 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 I again in hindsight can see that I was clearly seeking something Mm -hmm. I just didn't know it Mm -hmm. but when I think back about my own sort of bibliography if you will and how it passes through your life um it was very clear I was needing something I wasn't having Mm -hmm. yeah and I do want to talk to you because you are a notable librarian in this area <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the United States. I don't know about that. <laughs> so do you do you want to share a little bit of your bibliography? I mean, from that time to now, anything you would share to someone else on that on that journey? Yeah, along around the same time, read the Red Tent was published. I love the Red Tent. Um, that was an important work for me. Um, I was also, you know pursuing leadership reading Mm -hmm. um and so all you know how do you be a leader and a woman and true to yourself and ending up in a position where people do see you they know who you are you have a, a bit of a stage if you will um which isn't necessarily sought for right you just follow your passion and when you're passionate about something you're going to put your all into it, which then sometimes comes with an audience, which was always surprising to me. I'm like, what? Yeah, were you expecting the audience? <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that, no, I didn't, <laughs> what? Um, <clears throat> so that's always entertaining. Mm-hmm. 
when people go, oh, yeah, I know who you are. And you're like, you do? It's oh, kind of scary, I bet. It's terrifying. <laughs> like, what have I done? Right? <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> what have I said? You know, am I in trouble? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so uh, let's see. Who else was I reading a lot of? Oh, my second choice mm-hmm. for talking today, mm-hmm. Wendell Berry. Okay. Jaber okay. Crow, the Jaber Crow trilogy. Okay. Um, most people know Jaber Crow as the main character of the first book in that trilogy by Wendell Berry, who's a farmer and a poet and a philosopher. Teaches at University of Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, most people know him as a poet, but he is a novelist as well. Because, again, at the time, I lived in a small town, smaller community, rural community, and mm-hmm. I was watching... Here in Virginia? Uh-huh. Okay. The Walmart move in. The big box stores move in. Mm-hmm. And watching the local hardware store close. And watching the local jewelry store close. And what and the impact of that. And, of course, Wendell Berry's maxims, you know, include, you know, vote with your dollar, right? How do you want your community to be? And if you want choices, then you don't shop at the Walmart. Um, And so his just his uh, thought leadership really was having a great impact on me at the time. I was also in a great big love affair with Appalachian literature. (laughs) I was reading Ron Rash. Um, I was reading Silas House, who have a little bit of a fangirl crush on. So Don't tell your husband. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> He's like, who's this guy? You have all of his books. I'm like, oh, that's Silas House. We're going to be inviting him <laughs> to an author reading. <laughs> right. And Pancake. Um, mm-hmm. Just uh, all the traditional Southern writers, uh, Appalachian writers. And um, that was informing my work ethic and belief system a bit as well, just as much as Una did, you know, with folks who – made a life in Appalachia. Dang. That's some hardship. Yeah. Um, and it, it's kind of all of these books kind of like, you know, girl, you better stop complaining about anything and have great admiration for acts of creation that were born out of necessity. Um, you know, these old mills and cabins that are being lost to time. You know, uh, the the... <clears throat> old arts of driving a horse and a wagon, of growing things, mm-hmm. of but also of serving your neighbor. Absolutely. You know, so, yeah. Those were a lot of the things that were shaping me as I was growing into the library leader that I am now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I was, I sort of took you on a tangent, but mm-hmm. I, I thought that would be really interesting if well, you were willing to you. share. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Um, it's been interesting. My readership now is, um, I still like a good long book. Okay. Good <laughs> how, long one. I, here's, how many books do you read a year if you're reading long books? I'm just um, curious. I probably read four or five books a month. So okay. whatever the math does. I do not go on, like, the Goodreads sites. I feel okay. like that makes it homework. Yeah. Um, and I lead a book group for the Library of Virginia. Mm-hmm. And so they're always um, tossed in there, too. And it, that's always a stretch because it's things I might not have picked up to read, which yeah. is wonderful. What kind of books do you have in that book club? So it focuses on the nominee, the finalists and the winners of the Virginia Literary Awards, which is LVA's award for yeah. Virginia authors. It's in the fall. <clears throat> it's in the fall. It'll be mm-hmm. in September this year. Okay. Feel free to buy a table. I, 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 hey, drinks in the library. <laughs> we can That's make, right. Oh, my God. <laughs> to you my should. listeners, we need to start making money, people. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, but no, I, it looks awesome. I have not been yet. It's so fun. Mm-hmm. It's so fun. And everybody that's there, like last year was our 200th, Library of Virginia's 200th birthday, and um, we started awarding patron of letters, which we had not done for eons, and Nikki Giovanni was there, Aww. you know, and just, you know, you just get to talk to people. Uh, Margaret Eads, who's mm-hmm. a... Um, contemporary nonfiction writer here in Richmond, but she writes about really heavy historical topics Mm -hmm. and social justice. And, you know, sitting there having a chat with Margaret over a glass of wine. You know, it's just a really lovely event and humanizes authors, which, you know, I think as librarians and readers, we tend to elevate authors, but they're just people. They're just human beings. And to hear their stories, that's when they come to our book groups where I say, what's the birth story of your work? 
Yeah. Because there's always some pivotal moment where they go, oh, I have to write about this. And it's really cool to hear that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Check out what y'all are reading. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next month we're reading Gangsters of Capitalism by Jonathan Katz. Okay. So that'll be fascinating because, again, not a book I would have picked up. There you go. Yeah. Learn something new every month. That's right. Yeah. Um, so coming back to the story, and I know Cena said that she she tends to write these stories that, like, she'll see one person's perspective, and she's like, we have to find out more. And so she said that that's what she did with Una, and that she had no idea all of Una's backstory. I think it would be interesting if you would talk about, like, where did Una come from, and where did she go? It's a few different settings. Yes, there are. She, gosh, she goes all over the place. Um, As you can imagine, from being on a ship, Mm -hmm. you know, she spends a lot of time on the water. Yeah. Um... And on the ship, the Peakwood. And so they go all over the place, um, you know, to the tropics and back. And, you know, but New England is the primary setting. Mm -hmm. And she starts out in Kentucky. She starts out in Kentucky. Thank Mm -hmm. you. (laughs) And I think that's where I was trying to put it all together. That's where Cena is from or where she lives now. Yes. And that's where I met her was at a South at the time when I met her, I, um, Owned a small independent bookstore, and it was at the Southeastern oh, cool. Booksellers Association okay. uh, conference, and so that's where I met her. And yes, now that you have said that, that does all come back to me. Um, so yeah, but then she's up on the ship, but then she comes back to Nantucket, and yep. it's the drinks. One of the things I do love about this book mm-hmm. is that it's um, got lots of epistolatory writing. You yes. know, lots of letters to right. and from, and mm-hmm. she and Aunt Agatha trade some barbs via the pen, and so much writing because again, no cell phones. Mm-hmm. No typewriters. Yeah. They, that's how they did it. It would be months. But you, know, you send a letter, maybe you get a response, maybe you wouldn't. I cannot imagine. Right? <laughs> Isn't it crazy? <laughs> how did people survive? Yeah. As we yeah. sit here in a lovely air-conditioned home with electric lighting and a cocktail. Yeah. That we didn't have to go, yeah. you know, lay trade chickens for. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I, we're very fortunate. I. But, yeah, the whole time between the letters. But there is sort of, you know. As you were saying, like lost arts, that is definitely yes. one of the ones. Yes. Um, yes. You know, at least sending yeah. a note here or there, a handwritten yes. note is always appreciated. And yes. I think it's a special form of communication. Yeah. But yeah, that was um, really beautiful. So, so do you read, you already said you read long books like this mm-hmm. quite a bit. So, have, and have you, you've read at least one other of her books? Have you yes. read others? I have read. Um, the um, Four Spirits, which mm-hmm. is, again, about the four children who were um, killed in the, church bombing. in the church bombing. Mm-hmm. She also wrote, wrote a book called Abundance, and it's after this book, so it's not in my flyleaf, but um, it's about Marie Antoinette. Oh, cool. And again, just another amazing, immersive not 640 pages. Perfect. A uh, long depiction of the person who was Marie Antoinette yeah. and all of the things around her mm-hmm. um, and the people around her and all of those different perspectives leading up to her, let them eat cake and beheading, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it was a beautifully written book. Okay. Um, you probably know that Sherlock and Love, the movie, no. was inspired by her Oh, I didn't she, know that. That was a novel she wrote. Oh, cool. Um, if you've read the book, don't see the movie. If you've seen the movie, don't read the book. Are they both good, though? Because I think I'll always, always come down on the side that the book is better. Right. Of course. <laughs> I even have a of sticker course. on my cart that says the book was better. <laughs> um, uh, but I feel like the movie was fine. Yeah. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll maybe fine. watch it again. They forced me to. <laughs> But, you know, the the kinds of books that I read, uh, and it's, it's going to sound weird and crazy, and people are going to go, really? Um, I like difficult books. Mm-hmm. I like books that are a little dark, mm-hmm. a little lonely. Mm-hmm. Um, William Kent Kruger's This Tender Land, mm-hmm. among my favorite. And people are like, really? I'm like, yeah, it's so inspiring. They're like, ah. Um, you know, so I don't know what twisted part of my personality that <laughs> that, that speaks to. Uh-huh. Um yeah. Joanne Harris. You know, they uh-huh. wrote three, four quarters of an orange and 
the butchers, master butcher singer club, and uh-huh. uh, you know, there's all yeah, yeah. What do you find inspiring about those stories? You know, I really don't know. I just love a good dark sort of twisty immersive experience. Mm-hmm. It may be, maybe maybe mm-hmm. there's something in there that's making me go. Yeah, look, see, it could be worse. Okay. <laughs> right? When I think about, you know, just, you know, when I get grumpy and like, oh, I have to do this. No, I have to do this. And the world is terrible. And, you know, we're all going to go to hell. And it's like, <laughs> humanity is terrible. Uh-huh. You know, that I then read something else and go, yeah, we're not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I have some twisted piece of brain that, that likes that stuff. That connects with it. Okay. Well, yeah. um, I was also curious, like, because there's a lot of spiritual and religious um, stories in here. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I, I know there's, like, a scene where she's, like, looking at the stars. I mean, did you connect with any of that? Very much so. Um, I did grow up and continue to be a um, pretty faithful person mm-hmm. um, in my particular faith tradition. And yet, or and, just and, no mm-hmm. yet. And I find tremendous inspiration and spirituality from the natural world. Um, you know, the leaves, the, the trees, the, the idea of um, Fibonacci sequence and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even the damn pollen, right? <laughs> that there's this master design and I yeah. just think that it just inspires me so. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains and I always consider them my fortress. Um, and when I get back and I, you know, I go to visit my mom and I see the Blue Ridge Mountains and I go, oh. yeah. you know, so there's this sense of exhale and sense mm-hmm. of place. And, and certainly Nasland and, and the other writers that I um, mentioned earlier are very much about the place. Mm-hmm. And um, I relate to that a lot, so that, that outdoors-ness. We yeah. used to live on a farm, so it was, you know... I sort of miss that here in Richmond, but then when it's cold and rainy outside and I don't have to go chop ice off a horse trough, I don't miss it so much. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I do miss that, and, and I probably over-romanticize all of it mm-hmm. because it's hard work. Right. Um, yeah. But I'm glad I got to do it. Yeah. I mean, the joy of doing things, the mm-hmm. joy of hard work, yeah. too, sometimes. Yeah. doesn't feel that way at the time, though. Yeah. Well, and sometimes, you know, we have jobs that at the end of the day, we don't have a thing, like an object to show for mm-hmm. it. We don't make things. We don't produce things. Right. We don't, you know, you could, it's like pouring water in a sieve. You can pour into it all day long. At the end of the day, you've got nothing there. Yeah. And so for me, the act of outdoor work, growing something, um, you know, mending a fence, riding a horse, you know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. or cleaning a stall, that's mm-hmm. a tangible thing you can say, oh, I did this. And now I have this result. Right. I'm a big knitter. I think it's the same reason. Yeah. Like you can be doing a thing yeah. and have something to show for it. Yeah. As a sort of a counterpoint to our profession. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. It definitely feels yeah. like sometimes it's like, what did I do all day? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like I killed myself today. Yeah. I was working so hard and I got in the car and I was like, thank God I get to go have a drink. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> and, and I didn't probably leave my chair more than four times through the whole day. Yeah. And, you know, that's not really a, a way a human should live. See, I did want to say something about the title. Contrast, so it's Ahab's wife or the stargazer. Indeed, the contrast is Moby Dick Huge. or the whale. Yeah. I thought, I didn't even think about that until I was yeah. watching the interview yeah. with her. Yeah. She has, she... If you haven't read both, it almost does do you a disservice in reading um, Ahab's Wife Mm -hmm. because she parallels a lot of things that Melville does, Mm -hmm. but she does them better and she twists them to a way that goes, oh, no, you don't. Yeah. You know? And so even the title itself, Ahab's Wife or the Stargazer, you almost have to choose which one you're going to call it, right? Right. And I'd call it the Stargazer. Okay. But, you know. If you look in the card catalog, it's going to say Ahab's yeah, wife. wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just depends on with whom you identify, right? Do you yeah. identify with Ahab's wife or do you identify with the stargazer? Right. I identify with the stargazer. Oh. And, you know, I think this is why, um, you know, you see authors that crank out book after book after book, year mm-hmm. after year after year, and she doesn't do that. No. And it's because she bothers, right, mm-hmm. to take the time and get to know the characters and the details and the history and the the other fiction that might be informing this or the um, 
opposite perspectives than the norm. Mm -hmm. And I just love that about her. Mm -hmm. And yet all I could say was, I love your book. (laughs) (laughs) And what did she say? (laughs) Well, I was at the end of a long line of people. She was just like, thank you. Thank you. Sign my book. Go home now. (laughs) Yeah, go home now. Same thing happened. I got to meet Wendell Berry. Uh and, And I expected him to be this, like, grandfatherly fellow Mm-hmm. A, I'm not a tall person, and he is a hundred feet tall. Oh, really? Hundred feet tall, uh-huh. and he's also got a very kind of stern affect. Mm-hmm. And again, I had sort of waited at the end because I thought I would have some profound thing to say, and I had a stack of books because mm-hmm. I have almost all of his books. Mm-hmm. And I get up there, and he looks at me, and I wanted to say something to him about land conservation because that's a, you know, big thing for him. It's a big thing for me, and um. He just looked at me and I blah, 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 I blabbered something. And he just started signing my books. Didn't say a thing to me. I was, so I was a little afraid. I was like, oh, I'm afraid of Wendell Berry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you read nothing of Wendell Berry's, uh, pick up this little booklet called In Distrust of Movements. In Distrust. Okay. It's a small, tiny little book of like nine essays. Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of his worldview. And he asserts... In that particular essay of that name, um, that by the time a movement has a name, mm-hmm. it's lost its focus. Okay. And um, I feel that a lot right now in library land with all of the book challenges that are going on. Yeah. And, yeah. So <laughs> I highly recommend, a listener, for you to find that in Distrust of Movements okay. by Wendell Berry. Um, I think it'll I, th- I think it'll have an impact on how you view world happenings right now. Okay. Yeah. Definitely for all our librarian listeners out yes. there right now. Yes. So yes. everything that's going on. But Whew. it's a lot. It and is so, a lot. As I always say, you know, support your local library. And, that's right. Um, well, my mom, my 95-year-old mom, I was whining, frankly, to her about all of the book banning that's going on. And she said, oh, honey, this too shall pass. Mm-hmm. We've lived through it so many times. Yeah. You know, the 50s, the 30s. And what she pointed out to me that I think is so true is that when our world becomes unstable, as it is right now, um, people get afraid. And so they try to control the things they can control. Mm -hmm. And this seems like one of them. When we go, you know, gosh, don't people have bigger things to think about? Well, it's a fear response. Yeah. And so when I think about that, it helps me have compassion for the people who are on what I perceive to be the wrong side of book banning, mm-hmm. um, to think about they're in fear of something. What is that thing and how can I help them become less afraid yeah. um, as a point of compassion and civil communication? Mm-hmm. That there's something going on with them that, that makes them afraid. What are they so afraid of that this book could threaten everything about their existence? Mm-hmm. And um, so I keep trying to remember that that... The book banners have never won, and that we just, and, you know, mom says, she, she, we're sorry you're having to live through it, mm-hmm. but you'll come through it. Yeah. So I thought that was very wise. Yes. But I guess that's what happens when you live to 95. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen a few You've things. You've seen a few things. Yeah. 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 Well, I think, I mean, on a smaller scale, I have often said to staff You're that I am their supervisor. boss. I get there. I'm their supervisor. Um, it's very, I have been able to, when dealing with upset people, is to try to imagine them th- through the eyes of someone that loves them. Yes. Um, I had this very angry woman, and she, I could see she was with her grandchildren. And I just thought, and she was, being very aggressive with me and I just thought try to see her as her grandchildren see her with mm-hmm. love yeah. and it was like yeah. switch flipped all yeah. of a sudden she calmed down yeah. and it wasn't I wasn't being at all aggressive towards her but mm-hmm. I was taken aback right and mm-hmm. I was sort of thinking this crazy lady mm-hmm. but I was able to mm-hmm. That's exactly see right. it a little bit differently and it worked I don't know if it works every time but it worked that one time so that's well, the story I use that's right and then you have to just <laughs> keep trying because yeah they are humans, mm-hmm. and humans have flaws. We all do, and yeah. and if we can just show some compassion to each other, it's the only place to start. 
It's not easy, though. No, it's not <laughs> no easy. No one's saying it's easy. You want to, you know, <laughs> knock them upside the head and, yeah. and, and go, I don't understand. And that's right. really it. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Help me understand. Yeah. And, and I don't. Um, and that's where it comes back to the fear piece. I think we can probably get to the last question, okay. which is who would you recommend this story to? I was thinking hard about this mm-hmm. because, you know, not everybody's going to want to go read a 648-page book. <laughs> <laughs> and the abridged version, like I said, was still not short. <laughs> no, no. So um, I would say that, you know, people who like an immersive experience mm-hmm. would like this. Um, I look at this book through a lens of feminism, but it could equally just be a great adventure story, mm-hmm. you know, treasure yeah. Island for women, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so I, I do, I, I think that serious readers, male or female would get a lot out of this book from the context of what it was really like to live their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, the historical accuracy is excellent. Uh, so if you're a historical fiction fan, this, mm-hmm. this would work for you. Um, but I really do encourage anybody who's really kind of going on their own journey about who they are, you mm-hmm. know, and all the things that Una tried out that didn't work yeah, and then moved on to something else, you know, it gives you, it almost gives you permission to keep trying something else mm-hmm. until you find the thing that fits. Yeah. Um, so I feel like if you were in that place, this might be a good mm-hmm. book for you. Well, she loses and gains a fortune several times, I think. Several times. <laughs> like, it gives us all hope. Maybe there is a fortune out there for me to gain. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and I also wanted to ask, like, what's some exciting things that you've got coming up or uh, things we can look forward to seeing? Ooh. Um, from a work perspective or? A- Either. Either. You know, something you would... Something you'd want to share with anyone listening? Well, I'm currently the president of the Virginia Library Association, yes, as yes. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do want to say that our f- October conference, mm-hmm. we are zhuzhing it. <gasps> I, I used to say we're breaking the conference, but okay. that sounds violent. Yeah. So I'm going to say we're zhuzhing the conference. There are going to be a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And our theme is um, welcome to the library tour. Yes. So I, it, you know, I assume there are a lot of librarians listening and I think it's going to be so fun and we're going to have a lot of different things um, with our social is not going to be people sitting around listening to an over loud DJ. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to be doing some really fun and interesting things in that the participant, the registrants that come to the conference can participate in, mm-hmm. um, in the building of the conference. We're going to have an art show. <gasps> we're going to have a makerspace. Okay. Um, it's, it's just going to be a really joyful, um, I want to almost say we're like, we're taking back our joy in librarianship mm. because it's been such, I mean, first COVID, mm-hmm. uh, and all the things that went on with COVID mm-hmm. and now the book banning <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's time for us to take control of our joy again. Yeah. And so the library conference is going to be that. I'm excited. Um, but to take my own advice, um, last summer I was feeling sorry for myself and, an artist, an Australian artist, Tracy Verdugo, had something up on her Instagram and said, would you like to paint in Spain with Tracy? And I'm like, why, yes, I would. Oh. And so I am going in September to Spain for 12 days awesome. to um, Almeria, which is on the southern coast, and um, going to this art retreat in a hacienda in the Almerian National Park um, huh. to paint. That's that's I'm going to be beautiful. so excited. Absolutely. And you're going, are you going with anybody? Are you by yourself? I'm going by myself. There is a small group. There will only be 15 other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I told my husband, I was like, I'm not invited. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I just bought my plane tickets. Oh. I'm so excited just to have that time and space apart. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's so good. I mean, the cre- uh, creativity is good for your soul. And as it you're is. saying, all that outdoor time you'll probably get. Yeah, so. yeah. You know, I feel like creativity is something that's bashed out of us uh, mm-hmm. as we grow up in traditional school settings and yeah. at work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of the library idea with conferences. How yeah. can we retake our creativity and not have it be about, can I draw? That has nothing to do with your creativity. Yeah. Um, the act of creation can look like many things. And so... 
Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for I'm very excited for the conference. You know, I'll be there. Yes, you're always (laughs) on board. I appreciate that. (laughs) So, well, wonderful. Well, thanks so much. Thank being you here. for inviting me. Yeah. It was delightful. Yeah, this is great fun. I got to yes. learn a little about Cena. Yeah. Ahab. Maybe someday I will read Moby Dick. Maybe. Maybe. Don't we'll feel like you have to. <laughs> Thank you for spending some time with me and my guest for an episode of Drinks in the Library. For more information about the show, you can find us on Instagram at Drinks in the Library, on the World Wide Web drinksinthelibrary.com or shoot me an email at drinkspod at gmail.com. Until next time, cheers.